King James Bible was written to be understood by every subject in his realm. And over the past 400 years, Christians found justification in its text to depose kings, to free slaves, to chastise the rich, to empower the poor, but also to burn witches and to stone adulterers. But is the Bible still relevant today? Well, Francesca, as somebody who's studied it again and again, back to front, is it fact? Is anything in there historical fact? Uh, very little, probably. Um, I think one important thing to bear in mind is that ancient writers had a very different understanding of what fact or fiction was from, from us today. Um, it wasn't written to be a factual account of the past. I don't think that's the way in which these biblical writers understood the past. Um, but as a historian of, of the Bible, I think there's very little that's factual. King David? No. Moses? No. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said Jesus behind me. I don't think it, they were taking the Lord's name in vain. No, Jesus. Um, yeah. Most scholars would agree that he existed, yeah. 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 Uh, so uh, a hodgepodge of writings by different writers, scribes at different times with different agendas. Absolutely, and, and a hodgepodge is like not doing it a great service. I mean, this is a very sophisticated collection of ancient literature. I mean, it's fantastic stuff. It really is. Mm. Lots of different genres, lots of different sorts of traditions that are, that are being adopted and adapted and then readapted um, by successive writers. These are very creative people that were producing these texts. It's, it's brilliant stuff. But the, the, the sum of it, was it put together somewhat arbitrarily? That's the point I mean by, by hodgepodge over the years, for, for a purpose. I mean, the, the books that are there, why those books? Why not very, other books? Very few of the biblical books were written to be included in a Bible. Yeah. That's quite a late idea, late from my perspective as a, as a yeah. historian. Um, <laughs> yeah, so they weren't necessarily written to be included in a Bible. Um, these are religious writings. Some of them got into the Bible, some of them didn't, as we know. Um, the choices that were made as to what should be contained in this collection, I mean, it, it's very hard to say. Some things were obviously more appropriate, the, the collectors felt, than others. Bishop Michael. Yes, I mean, I, I agree with Francesca that there are many different genres in the Bible. There are, you know, there's obviously poetry in the Bible, mm. there are proverbs, uh, but there's also history. I mean, take, for instance, uh, the sudden appearance in archaeological evidence of the rather crude dwellings of the Israelites superimposed on the rather sophisticated dwellings of the Canaanites. The sudden d disappearance of the cults that Francesca is so interested in of Asherah and Baal. Uh, why did these things happen? Because something historical had happened. Another people had come into the land and supplanted those who had already been there. Well, that's historical. But archaeologically, uh, it's, it's very difficult to tell a Canaanite from an Israelite. Well, archaeologically, I'm just pointing out the differences. The, the crude uh, housing that the Israelites, as former nomadic people, had used. Uh, the, the fact that these cultic uh, shrines suddenly stopped being built. I mean, something was happening and we have to give an account of what was happening. But if most of that, it didn't happen, why should we pay most of it? But it did happen, of, you see. Well, Noah's Ark? Well, I'm, I'm talking about what happened in Canaan. Um, I'm not saying that everything in the Bible is, is historical, because clearly it isn't. I mean, there's saga, there's poetry, mm. there are proverbs, there is wisdom, uh, but there is also material that is historical. I mean, the mm. writing prophets, for instance, uh, bear witness to contemporary events that were happening all around them. Now, you may have a different interpretation of those events. The, their enemies at that time certainly did. Mm -hmm. And quite a lot of what we know about Israel, actually, we know from their enemies. Mm -hmm. What the conquering kings and those passing through the armies, uh, what they tell us. Uh, their accounts may be different, but they're witnessing to the same sorts of peoples and events that were going on. I think this kind of radical skepticism is unwarranted. Radical scepticism. Yeah, I get that quite a lot. Um, I bet you do, yeah. I think... You deserve to get it, yes. But I, I think it's important to point out that what you might perceive as radical scepticism actually is 
is all about debates that we've been having in academia for a well, long time. Uh, I'm not. Which, which academia? Albright, John Bright, G.E. Wright, well, which, which academia? Been, we been Kathleen Kenyon. A long time. Well, well that doesn't make that very... work irrelevant. I mean, being no, dead doesn't make not. academics irrelevant. Well, it, it does make it outdated in terms of the ways in which academia engages with other branches and other disciplines I which see. help us to understand this is just sensationalism i mean most mainstream archaeology would accept that there is a historical basis to what there is of history in the bible as i say not everything I in the bible say is there history. Was no history well you said hardly any facts i said you... hardly any facts exactly <laughs> i think the point remains is that of course there are some things in the bible that broadly happened. I'm the exile very glad you, of the very glad you think so. <laughs> <laughs> How just generous. Because, but just, and equally, just as you said, there's a lot that is isn't but even you say that you say the uh, in fact the Psalms are mm. about uh, somebody's mm. emotional uh, and religious state. The pr Proverbs are about wisdom. Uh, I mean, there are different sorts of the Song of Solomon you, that Professor Dawkins likes. How do you know whether to read something as history or the, something as not history in well, the Bible? Well, the Book of Kings or uh, the, the Chronicles or Ezra and Nehemiah, I mean, uh, the writing prophets that I've mentioned, uh, I mean, there are historical things in them that need to be investigated and interpreted. Well, the book of Isaiah has material that stretches over several centuries. Of course it And does. it only has the well, name of one prophet. Yes, but that's, his, that's a historical point. Can I, can I just, just move it on from you two? Fascinating as it is to, 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 to hear this as <laughs> historical. R Rabbi Laura, no Moses, no David, they don't exist. It undermines Judaism. Well, I, it doesn't undermine anything as I'm listening to you. I have a completely different take on what fact is and what my approach is to the Bible. That when I look at the Bible, I'm not, I'm not a archaeologist or historian in that way. I'm looking at it as a teacher, as a theologian, and for me it has truth. It has truth that changes my life. Yeah. It has truth that I think affects other people's lives. It has things that I love. It has things that I can't stand. And I'm entering that debate. So the fact of what was, whether there was Babylonian, whether there was David or Moses, there's lots of information that says, or Scholars who say there was Moses and why might have been with a different and slightly different name, but I'm not entering that phrase. So it doesn't need to be historically true because there is truth in it. There is a greater a truth. A completely different yeah. kind of truth. Yeah. So Richard, I mean, it's similarly, there are, there are great truths in the Greek fables, aren't there, of, of mythology. It doesn't need to be true for us to derive um, truth from it. The world is full of origin myths and creation myths and myths of all kinds, and many of them are very beautiful. But what worries me about the Bible is that it has acquired in our civilization an enormous privileged position. I mean, everybody knows something about the Greek myths and the, and the Valhalla myths and so on, and some other myths as well. Mm. And they are interesting and they're treated as interesting myths. But the Bible myths are given a special privileged treatment. I mean, they are, uh, they're regarded as somehow set off on one side away from all these other myths. No doubt you'll find truths in the other myths. You'll find some truths of that kind in Australian that, Aboriginal myths. Yes, although I'm looking for God. Well, which God? I mean, why not Jupiter? Why not Zeus? Why not, why not Thor? Yes, I... I think that... Let me just me, stay over here yes. just for, let hear, let hear, hear Richard out. Yeah, go on. Well, I, uh, that's about it, really. I mean, I, 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 I object to the way... <laughs> I hope there's more to come from you. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was simply objecting yeah. to the way the Judeo-Christian myth has permeated our society to such an enormous extent as though somehow it has special truths which are not to be found in, in other myths. And I don't think there's much truth to be found in any myths, as a matter of fact, but there, certainly there's no reason why the Judeo-Christian myth should be given this privileged status. And as for it not being literally true, of course, sophisticated theologians and historians don't think it's literally true, but 40%, 45% of the American people believe literally in Adam and Eve, believe literally that the world is only 6,000 years old. Mm. I mean, that's a shocking figure, and mm. you can't duck out of it by saying, oh, sophisticated theologians mm -hmm. don't, don't believe it. Unfortunately, what sophisticated theologians believe isn't really relevant to what the majority of Christians do believe. Um, well, you, Chris, I think, uh, Richard, Q. Chris from the Evangelical Alliance, if I may, because <laughs> you believe it's all true, don't you? I so, do, yeah. So you believe that, um, you know, Adam and Eve and, and, and Noah's Ark, you believe, to so just take something, Genesis 19.5, two angels came to, to Lot's uh, house in uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, 
Now, he was the only uh, righteous man in the village, and uh, the locals wanted to, to know the angels. They wanted to homosexually rape the angels. So Lot offered his virgin daughters instead <laughs> as an appeasement. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah was, was demolished uh, after that, and his wife um, turned into a block of salt when she looked back. I take you my, believe that happened? I take my cues from Jesus, who we've already agreed. So, uh, is you, historically did that accurate. happen? Uh, I believe that I Jesus believed the Old Testament to be historically accurate. Do you believe that that happened? I believe it happened because Jesus did. But. The, um, I don't think Nikki, we know whether Jesus believed it happened yeah, or not. Yeah. And I believe that, that that appalling, horrendous, horrific story was talking about obedience to God and, and, and various other things. It was not, it was not about, um, you know, is it literally true and, uh, you know, should we believe it? And we have absolutely no idea. Uh, but he was the most righteous man in the village, and he offered his virgin yeah. daughters as a yeah. What were the rest uh, like? Well, it, uh, appalling. But, but, but you see, it was written about yes. about people by men, and they were usually men um, with a certain worldview understanding. But, I mean, but, if but you what go Richard through, has identified yes. is there are an awful lot of people in the world who, like Krish, believe it's all true. Yes, but I think Chris yes, would you're, also say that the most important thing about it, and don't let me put words in your mouth, yeah. is that it points to a bigger truth. Yeah. And you say, well, why should the Bible get privileged status? Is because maybe, because the other myths that you were referring to earlier have contained truths that we as human beings all resonate to, but perhaps the Bible taken um, opens a window onto truth that has endured, that we see our own human yeah. natures um, spelled out in, in the pages of the Bible, we can relate to what's going on, and we find a truth that endures. Adrian, Adrian it, is it isn't even true that Jesus thought that that story was true. I mean, when Jesus refers to Solomon and Gomorrah, he's talking about the hospitality laws, which are being grossly infringed yeah. by the behaviour of Lot. Yeah. So to assume that the story is about homosexuality is, would just be really quite a false thing. And he didn't even so, comment on the fact that the poor um, daughter was, was put out instead, you know. I mean, no. he didn't comment on that, no. unfortunately. No. So what lesson are we supposed to get from Richard. that story? What, what moral lesson? Well, well, well there's somebody well, missing in the story. We're going to come on to the moral lessons in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. There's but, somebody but, missing. But touch on it now, uh, Richard. What's well, we question? were just told that, that what you get from the, from the Bible is moral lessons. Yeah. And presumably, you say this didn't literally happen, but it's telling us something. What is it telling well, us? Well, the moral okay, so lesson is... Let's listen to the voice the that's missing is. in this story, which is Abraham. Yeah. Abraham turned to God yeah. and argued with God. Exactly. So the message that I get from this story is argue about it, debate about it, don't accept it as true completely. Well, why in that case, it. why did it? <laughs> if, if you want to convey a message, which is in this case argue about it, why not just say argue about it? Why <laughs> no, wrap it up? It's, that Do you want to remember that message? Richard Michael, Michael, is this not, if I may ask you, you a question? You don't even know what the message is. Yeah. That's how obscure yeah, it is. Richard Michael, Richard yeah. Michael, yeah. Michael yeah. Let me, allow yeah. me to ask a question, please. Yes. Is this not just classically cherry picking and taking the bits not that you're comfortable with? You. you are doing the cherry picking because you chose the story. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> There are hundreds, hundreds of more edifying stories in the Bible, but you didn't choose them. Why don't you ditch you, that you one? You're the one who wants to cherry let me, just say, let me just say, you must not confuse, as Professor Dawkins does in his books, between the descriptive aspects of the Bible and the prescriptive ones. Mm -hmm. Just because the Bible describes some horrendous incident, it doesn't mean that the Bible approves of it. Uh, and the point about Abraham, with all due respect to the rabbi, is mm -hmm. not that he argued with God, but that he was asking for mercy mm -hmm. for the inhabitants That's of true. these cities. That's true. Uh, that, that is the significant thing. And what, furthermore, what Jesus saw as significant about Sodom and Gomorrah uh, was that it was its sin, its mm. wickedness, that led to its destruction. That's the lesson to be learned from. Yeah. <laughs> Professor Stephen Lowe. What lesson? Uh, sorry, Professor, what am I talking about? <laughs> Professor, is it Bishop Dawkins? <laughs> no, that's most certainly not correct. Uh, sorry, Bishop. Uh, Bishop Stephen, what, what lesson do you get from it? 
from that particular story? Yeah. Sorry to cherry pick, but I thought it was an interesting one to, to, to talk about because it's pretty vile. Carry on. Because there are a whole number, in a sense, as Richard's pointed out, of myths and stories, particularly in the Old Testament. What I found fascinating is we found it quite difficult so far to talk about the New Testament, which for Christians is where we get our inspiration and understanding of the nature and life of Jesus. And it's fascinating that you have aimed so far the discussion at the Old Testament. It's chronological, Stephen. Well, yeah, I'm anxious that we should get on right, well, to, let's, to let's, what, what is at heart let's, the basis of the Christian faith. The facts and the extraordinary things that Jesus said. Well, I mean, let us start with the extraordinary things that Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, mm. which um, certainly are part of the oral mm. tradition, which was handed down from man and woman to man and woman uh, as it went through before it was written down, there's, I think, some evidence that, that uh, those actually were the words of Jesus. Mm. Uh, and at, at the very heart of the Christian faith, where we find inspiration and teaching which has inspired people down 2,000 years and changes people's lives, because at the heart of that is a moral code which has actually affected the whole structure of our societies and Western civilization and had its knock-on into other civilizations as well. we'll get, we're, we're going to get on to the morality of it in a minute. <laughs> evidence for this, Francesca? Um, evidence, what evidence? The only, the only things we know that Jesus said are the things that he is supposed to have said in the New Testament text. I have to say, the Sermon on the Mount, it's a beautiful piece of theology. It's a lovely piece of what some people call social justice. But actually, you know, any Jewish rabbi of the period could have said the same thing. This is a Jewish message. It's not a particularly innovative Christian message. And there's also parallels. Yes. Message. Yes. 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 Parallel. Indeed, the whole but... community of theologians and academics who've looked at the historical Jesus, and there are many of them, as you yeah. know, from very radical traditions in many cases, have identified certain sayings of Jesus as more likely than not of being yeah, original more sayings of Jesus. Than Jesus. Not, okay, not I can't prove so Stephen, anything about Christianity. Stephen. I just can't do it. But I do say there's a probability that those words, the words of Jesus, and the fact that they have gone through the ages and survived in that way and have got that element and ring of truth has inspired people over 2,000 years. So Just Stephen, if he, if he, if, did, he, did he raise Lazarus from the dead? Did he turn the water into water? Oh, no, if, he had a, if Jesus had come now and had a DNA test, half his DNA would come from his mother, what would the, uh, the reading for the other half be? You see, I don't find that a very important question for me. Um, I, no, the, the virgin birth is not something I find at the heart of my faith. Mm. I find the Sermon on the Mount at the heart of mm. my faith. I find Jesus teaching about justice and poverty and, and the way in which he inspired people and led people, the way in which he died and rose again. Those are the heart of my faith, not whether he was born of a virgin. Do you believe he was born of a virgin? Hey, hey, Adrian. Yeah, I think what you're doing, Nicky, is you, you're privileg privileging the, the literal sense. Mm. Now, if we ask the question, what is it to read the Bible? Prior to the Reformation, Christians would have uh, gone about it differently. They would have looked for a literal sense. They would have looked for a moral sense. Yeah. They would have looked for some allegorical sense, as if this might have told them something about the transcendent. And lastly, yeah. they would have looked for the anagogical sense, which is what we may hope for. Yes. What is there about the future? Yes. Now, at the time of the Reformation, it is the literal sense that gets privileged. That's why there's 45% of people in, in America who think that Adam and Eve were, were real people. And that is a gross distortion that has happened in Christianity. And we need to get back to the question, what is it to read the Bible well? And it's certainly not reading the Bible well to assume that everything in it has a kind of glass literal face to it. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 Um, let me take, take, we're going to go into the moral message from the Bible in just a second. But let's just take some, some comments. Uh, from, can I take you first? Yes. You look like you're vaguely qualified. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. I just wanted to pick up on the point that Professor Dawkins asked about mm. why didn't Jesus just say, there it is, you know, question. Oh, God, because he, he was talking about the Old yes. Testament, I think. Yes. Um, he, the whole point of the way that a lot of the Bible is written, both Old and New Testament, is that it is written in parables, it's written in stories, because that precisely does raise the fact that we are questioning people. And as anybody who's ever preached will know, if you just stand and give a literal message, you end up with law, you end up with stuff that people don't listen to. Whereas if you actually tell stories and put it into poetry, 
people's imagination is captured, mm. people's emotions are captured. And that's why the Bible is so important and has such a privileged position. I'll take you and then I'll go to the other side. Go on. Morning. Uh, yes. It, just going about the Bible, you know, if it's divinely inspired, it, there's going to be gaps. And Richard Dawkins, you keep mentioning like morals, but the Bible is way bigger than just morals. And if half, half America believes that Adam and Eve was literal, so what? You know, it's just a divinely inspired story. You believe it is divinely inspired. And let, let me take this gentleman over here. Hello. Um, I'd just like to identify the underlying argument which I think the panel has touched upon is that actually there's two sides of the way in which you'd read the Bible. You've got the academic side and you've got the devotional side. And I think in terms of relevancy for the Bible, I would say because the Bible is still one of the best-selling books of all time, for those who are devotional to the Bible, it's still relevant. But academically, I think there has been a move away from... Um, is this suspending rational judgment then, for, for the sake of, uh, you know, sorry, sorry, it, suspending rational judgment? Is that the devotional or not? No, I don't necessarily think, I just think for someone who's a devotional, I mean, I'm a devotional Christian, but mm. I also study it academically. Yeah. And I think as a devotional Christian, I'm quite happy to believe what Jesus said, because I believe that, you know, Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. But then as an academic, I also understand that you need to be able to critique and understand the okay. different viewpoints of the Bible. So I think... The real argument here is that actually we've got a devotional and an academic argument well, let's going get on, on to the, the moral argument. I mean, you say there's, that you say there's, 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 bigger, there's bigger stuff than morals. I'll bring you in in this next bit, okay, because I want to kick off the... the this is going to be, our, I think, the biggest section of our conversation this morning. Okay. The moral message uh, from, from the Bible. And, of course, R Richard, you, in your books, you've, you've been pretty scathing about the God of the Old Testament. Um, let me just quote you, if I, if I, if I may. The most unpleasant character in all fiction. Misogynistic, homophobic, racist, genocidal, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic. And you go on. It's, it's quite a list. That you... I should have thought that was beyond dispute, but I, I would come on to the, to the New Testament. What about the God of the New Testament? Um, here we have a God who wanted to forgive mankind its sins, including, by the way, the sin of Adam, who he presumably knew perfectly well never existed, nevertheless. He wanted to forgive mankind's sins. Why didn't he just forgive them? Why was it necessary to have a human sacrifice, to have his son tortured and executed in order that the sins of mankind should be absolved? Is that not the most disgusting <laughs> idea you ever heard? Why didn't he just forgive the sins? Why did he have to sacrifice a scapegoat? I think the most disgusting thing you've ever heard. Professor Dawkins has a view of cheap grace. A real forgiveness comes from restitution, from cost, from sacrifice. It is not God sacrificing his son. It is his son who, in obedience to the divine will, living the divine will in a society that has gone wrong, that is corporately wrong, which is what original sin means, by the way. So there can be no let forgiveness me without... Let me, let me just finish. Uh, it is his obedience in the context of a corrupt society that leads to his death. That is his sacrifice, and it is that which restores what was broken between God and human beings. So there could be no forgiveness without a death, is there? No, that no, right? it's not. I'm not saying that there can be no well, forgiveness without cost. How can you applaud that? How well, can you applaud that? Because it's true. Well, no, not everyone applauds. Some people did. But some people applauded you. Because you know. there's multiplicity of voices, and that's mm. fine. Mm. And, and I I, uh, Christina. I, I don't think um, that, that what happened to Jesus was necessary from the divine's point of view, but perhaps it was necessary for what happened in the context at that time. And what we mustn't forget is that after, after the death, came something that we believe is, a, is an unprecedented type of new life. Mm. Now, I can learn things about the universe from you. I can learn things about history from you. But one of the things that uh, I find more in um, engaging with the Bible and the stories it has in there is about the whys of the universe. Well, what about the Why are we here? What is the meaning and purpose for our lives? And to me, what comes out very clearly in what Jesus taught and said, mm. and certainly the writings afterwards, is the whole purpose is, is love. And, and I really think that we cannot get away from, and I know you, you cited that earlier story that was just that, that awful story from the Old Testament, but what, what the God I worship is a yeah. God of love. The, of the new, yeah. Uh, I, and, and, and Richard, just to come back to you, what about 
the, the extraordinary things that Jesus said, that the, the bishop uh, Stephen was, was talking about earlier on. For example, you know, love those who persecute. Oh, that's wonderful, of course. I mean, whoever said them, whether, whether it was Jesus or not, whether there was... But why should it called... not be Jesus? Well, why, I don't you know, care if it was Jesus. Yeah, it's a wonderful thing it to be? have said. I mean, why... Jesus might have said, let him finish the sentence. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> whoever, whoever said it, <laughs> why? Why should he not who, whoever said it, it was a wonderful thing to say, and of course, you can cherry-pick any document and find lovely things to say. Mm. But how do you decide what to cherry-pick? You decide what to cherry-pick on the basis of what you have decided is a good thing on other criteria. Mm. So we reject the horrific story of Lot and the angels and all the other horrific stories in the Old Testament and the mega horrific story, as I've just said, of the, of the New Testament. And you pick on nice stories like the Sermon on the Mount. But the criterion by which you do your cherry picking is, of course, something that we all share, which is we are decent human beings. That's where we get it from. But that's so we, we, we reject those other aspects of the, of the Bible, which are, frankly, horrible. But in the same way, if you listen to a, a, you, you, the songs that you listen to on the radio are those that speak to you and, and speak to your heart. In the same way, that's why you pick them, because they make sense and they speak to your heart and they move you. And that's why you cherry pick those particular ones. Of course. Also, so we, we, I don't want a hygienic Laura, life. Yeah. I don't want a life full of things that are just nice and just clean. There's lots that's messy and lots that's difficult that is in the canon and was right. kept in the canon. Yeah. And also the canon developed. So from a Jewish point of view, we continually developed how we see the Bible. So we continue to develop how we see God and how we see ourselves. Mm. So actually, I think there is truth in the messy, mm. horrible stories as well. That's right. Why? I don't think... <laughs> You, 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 look for, you look frustrated, well, Richard. Why bother with the Bible at all, then? I mean, you, you've got your nice messages that you can pick up from all sorts because of places. Because life's not about yeah. life messages. It's such a reservoir and a treasure house. And, and reading through it, um, I'm sure you relate to an awful lot of... of some of the well, what about the, the stuff St. Paul said, Christina, about women, for example? Um, I'm cherry-picking again, aren't I? <laughs> oh, to the right so, uh, submit to your husband as the Lord. It's a shame for women to speak in church. Uh, and all, it is, again, if necessarily... I have to tell you. You yes. have to filter the good stuff out, don't you? No. No, no you don't no? have to filter the good stuff out. What you have to say is, who was St. Paul? What was his overriding message? What did he want to do? And he wanted nothing and no one to get in the way of people to have an encounter with the living Christ. Now, I love St. Paul. Those things he wrote, what would... You have to do something that is called, in theological studies, hermeneutics. That is, what did the person who was writing then um, mean to the people he was writing well, for. And like what would he be writing today? Francesca, this what is, would this his is, message be today? This is, this is proper would, historical he study. Would, Why would they write against... against? I was going to say, yeah. you just made the point earlier that I do history and you do theology, but it seems to me for you to support your own theology, you need history. Of course, yeah, we need each other. So why are we relying on a collection of texts that are thousands of years old from societies completely different from our own? Because so St. Paul people. is one of, the, one of my favourite people, apart from um, the person of Jesus. Saint you wouldn't have been one of his by the signs of things. Pardon? You wouldn't have been one of his favourite people oh, by the signs of things. Absolutely, absolutely. If St. Paul were alive today, uh, speaking into our society, it would our be different. culture, with it, he would be completely different. And I'm sure he would He'd be... want women bishops. Absolutely. But that's, that's the least it, of it. That's Chris, would he want women bishops? Know, what he would he might want, do. <laughs> what he would want is a restored relationship, yeah. joking aside yeah. about women bishops, which mm. are yeah. they, between I, men I, and yeah. women. And he would want justice Let, and he would Dr. want Les. respect. Dr. Les Henry. Yeah. Author, what, what, I think is, people, um, mm. what I think is really interesting about what's happened in, so far in the programme mm. is... If we just take a step back and think about it, everything we're discussing is mediated through human beings. Yeah. We don't know how we got here. Science can't tell us how we got here. So the Christians will say it was by fiat through God. Scientists will say evolutionary processes, Big Bang, whatever. Hmm. That's the one question we can never answer. But what I find very interesting is today is that you'll have one Christian will say something, another one will disagree, and then they agree, and then they move on. Then they disagree and then they agree. And I find it interesting you use hermeneutics and you spoke about um, St. Paul more or less justifying what he did. Because the ends justifies the means. I think that's the bit you left out, but that was sort of where you were going. Mm -hmm. Now I find it interesting yes. that in the introduction to this program you can talk about Christianity used to free slaves. It was also used to enslave people like me. Absolutely. Hence, William Henry. Absolutely. It's not African name. It was, I'm an African it was used to justify slavery so as much as to free slaves, yeah. It wasn't just used to justify, it was also used to control and enslave people. Mm -hmm. 
It was also used to control and enslave people all over the place, not just in Africa. And for me, what I find very disturbing about these kind of conversations, and cherry picking is a very good word for me, is with many Orthodox Christians, they love to just use whatever justifies that point of the argument. But if you do point out the more unsavory aspects of what is in that book, all of a sudden you, can't dis you cannot even dis um, dispute that, which is why um, I believe it was suggested that it has this privileged position. And why does the Bible have that? Well, yeah. I always, oh, was one of, sorry, one of the things what I always say to people is, knowledge gives you the power to liberate or enslave. The Bible was used by the same Africans who were enslaved by it to liberate themselves. So why can't we look at it as a document that contains some truth, but is not the absolute truth, because it's mediated through human beings? Yes. And also, uh, it is used by Africans and other people as well still to uh, oppress homosexuals, you know, because, they, they, because they take that this, inference but from Nikki, it. this mm. is the point that I'm making. You can, because if mm. you give certain status to a book, yeah. you can dip into it and find a chapter or a passage or something that will justify any kind of inhuman treatment yeah. to any member of the human family. Because that humanistic sense is suspended. Why? Because you're using your authority to say, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. But the real question is, when somebody says, why shouldn't I do that? God says so. Suppose I don't believe in God. The Bible is not ultimate in the Christian faith. It's Christ who is ultimate in Christian exactly, faith. Exactly. We don't and worship the Bible. Exactly, we don't worship the Bible. Is, is there an uh, argument for ditching the Old Testament then? No, uh, no there's not, because, it, uh, because through the Old Testament we... I know, Laura, you're not going to support that. I know, I'm not, and also Hebrew, I don't call the it the Old no, Testament. Let's <laughs> well, just catch it. Can can it's it's can not politically me. incorrect, I'm yes. sorry. Yes. Yes. In your terms, it was religiously incorrect. Give me, give me a chance, I would have said that and said the same thing. Yes, I would not, not call it the Old Testament. What I do want to say is that a name for Jesus in the Second Testament is the Word. Jesus Christ is God the Word. That's the revelation of God. God, mm -hmm. it, it is the word made flesh. Now what the Bible is, it's the word made text. Now this constant conflation of the revelation of God in Christ with the book about all that inevitably raises the Bible to an ultimacy on which it cannot deliver. Yeah. That's because yes. we only know Jesus from what's written about well, him. Well, I know that. I know that. So we have to read the Bible to understand who Jesus is. <laughs> really? And we need the Old Testament in order to make sense of yes. Jesus' claims about himself. Um, and but I'm not and denying any of that. That's the only reason. What about, yes. what about the other positive aspect yes. of it? And Melvin Bragg, if I come back to Richard, and, yes. and you can all comment on this, and, and I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on this too, uh, uh, Bishop Michael. Melvin Bragg was arguing this position recently, that the great, some of the great civil rights movements well, Martin Luther King's speech was so bi wonderfully biblical in essence and in, in delivery. And uh, the, the, the also, uh, you know, overthrowing King Charles as well, the Puritans. M much of the, many of the progressive movements and much of the progressive politics has, been, has found its seedbed in, in the Bible. Melvin Bragg makes excellent points along those, those lines. And it's perfectly true, of course, that much of the rhetoric of the, po the political movements that one would wish to support comes from the Bible, because the Bible is the source of so much of our imagery, um, so much of our metaphors, so much of our literature. That's not at all surprising. Um, you can find good quotations in the Bible to support the point of view that you want to, uh, to, ad to adopt. And of course, you can find the exact opposite. So why not bypass the Bible altogether as a, as a source of uh, More authority awesome. and simply say, as Shakespeare said, as Milton said, as anybody you like, you quote anybody in literature you like, and as Isaiah said, or as Jesus said, you can get quotations from literature all over the place to bolster the point of view that you want to make. That's what Martin Luther King did, and many other people have done from the Bible. You can get it from Shakespeare, uh, you can get it from Milton, as I say, you can get it from, from Aldous Huxley, you can Dickens. get it from all sorts of people. Dickens. Um, the Bible should not be given the privileged status. We shouldn't be discussing here, is the Bible relevant today? We should be discussing, is literature generally relevant? Absolutely.
Especially I mean, Michael. Yes, I think literature is relevant, uh, but I, I'm afraid Professor Dawkins thinks that it is just of aesthetic relevance, whereas in fact literature has moral and spiritual well, relevance. Christopher Hitchens so, makes yeah. the point. Another let me, uh, sorry, let can me I just make this important? Because he says there's as much truth as there is in, 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 Tol in, in the Bible as there is in Tolstoy and Shakespeare. Which but was where, where did Richard Tolstoy get his truth from? Yeah. Hmm. I mean, Tolstoy, where did he... But the point, I think the central question that I think Professor Dawkins has actually asked is why should the Bible or the Judeo-Christian tradition have preeminence? And the reason for it is that the moral criterion by which we have become decent people has come from the Bible. It has come from the Decalogue. It has come from, just let, it has come from the Decalogue. It has come from the Sermon on the Mount. It has come from the moral and spiritual teachings of Judaism and Christianity. Uh, and see, that, just a minute, and that uh, moral criterion is then also used to critique the Bible. I mean, this is the great thing about the Bible. The, the writing prophets manifest that very clearly, that there is a principle of self-criticism in the Bible itself. This is why it has the capacity to liberate people. That is why Martin Luther King and others are using the Bible and not Shakespeare. I would be very interested to see a civil rights movement come out of Shakespeare. I think that, um, Nikki, again, even, you see, even if you go and do some research on Dr. Martin Luther King, he didn't only use the Bible, he used other forms really? of inspiration. Cool. And one of the things what he did was he opened up a dictionary in one of his sermons and he read all of the things about white, white, so virtuous, beautiful and good. And then he read all the things about black, white, was so dynamic, despised and whatever. And then he said, I am black and I'm proud because politically I know what that means. So let's not even distort Reverend Martin Luther King's oh, okay. message because I think that what is interesting for me, you mentioned decent, so then you're going to have some kind of oppositional indecent. No. But who determines who is decent yeah, and who is Dawkins indecent? Dawkins used the term. Because I mean. under some, any kind of, <laughs> but under any kind no, of proselytizing campaign, you will go up against what you consider to be Indecent. This could be people who are living yeah. naturally off the land, they ain't troubling anybody. Listen, sir, but I because have been not, and I Just have... a second, can I finish? I allowed you to. He's a just bishop. because. <laughs> I, I don't mean you rather don't long. Long. <laughs> You're what you are, I am what I am. We've got children, aren't we? We've got a voice. So to me, when somebody says, when somebody says, oh, I don't like the way they do things, it's unchristian. That rings serious alarm bells in my head because I want to know what does it mean to be Christian because is Christian decency what is happening right now in Libya, Afghanistan? A lot of these countries who, who forward and front these campaigns say they're doing it because of God no, and I, we're spreading I, I think civilization. Think I, no, I, I no, can only, in a minute, in a minute. I Laura. can only speak for myself when I listen to the discussion now and I think about the memoriality that comes to me from the Bible. What just happened now, the phrase that goes through my head is that we are all created in God's image. Yes. And that fundamental driving point for my view on justice and how we cheat each other of whatever sexuality and whatever gender drives me, and I derive that from the Bible. Guy, what's interesting about... It's false. Is it, what's interesting about the Bible and morality is that we've been talking about cherry-picking. So actually we have a morality which is outside the Bible, no, which is independent. Is no, I yes, that. we do. I and in fact, that. no, morality... Well, I'll be with you in a minute then. Morality does not come from the Bible. It comes from our evolutionary background, <laughs> and we've been developing it. Yeah. And, and, and let, we, let, let's and, expand on this, And please. we continue to develop it. For instance, within the last, within human, uh, within, within the last 70 years, we've had the Human Rights uh, Convention, which is a much more advanced morality than anything you find in the Bible, in my opinion. Uh, there was nothing. Yeah, okay. yes, you, you, dispute, you dispute that. Yeah, I do dispute it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the human rights uh, movement is, is a very good example. It, can, it is demonstrably the case that the idea of human rights, uh, of natural justice, has come from the Bible through the work uh, of people like Bishop Las Casas in America, of the Salamanca mm. Dominicans, of the moderate enlightenment personified in people like John Locke. Uh, it owes everything to the Judeo-Christian tradition. You may not like it, you may not agree with it, but that is uh, historically the case. Right. But the Judeo-Christian position was the, was the dominant you know, philosophical backdrop of the age, so they had but, to but derive... It was, it was rejected by Rousseau and Robespierre, and look where it led them. Richard Dawkins. Well, of course you can find verses in the Bible that sanction slavery as well. You can, once again, you can, you can cherry pick and, and why bother with the Bible at all when you can go straight to yeah, moral philosophy? Absolutely. I'm, I'm extremely scared of fundamentalism. 
The same fundamentalism that wants to convert people forcibly is the same voice as you have that says, why bother with this? What I'm concerned about is that you can't hear the different voices. Are you, you serious? Do yes. Look, <laughs> fundamentalism means tying your colours to, uh, to a particular book. And it's exactly or idea what I'm, and rejecting exactly, everything else. Exactly what I am doing is saying, do not tie yourself to a book. Look at the good ideas, reject the bad ideas, accept the good ideas, find good ideas wherever you may find them. That's the very opposite of fundamentalism. Yes, fundamentalism is saying, he, we have here a book, we have to follow what's in that book. Okay, so I wouldn't, that's not my approach that's to Biden. That's not your no, approach. Certainly not, not approach. nor approach. the approach of most progressive people in this country, Precisely. but as a key source text on which we grow and which we develop, and Judaism has taken the Bible and added and expanded and expanded and expanded, so that our rabbinic literature is vast, starting with the Bible, but don't, we don't live in the desert anymore, we're not uh, tribes in the desert, and there, thank God, no high priests. And so I live a very <laughs> different Judaism than the biblical one. Yeah, well, well, it is the of course, that, I'm delighted by all that, and that's exactly what I'm advocating, that, that we, we should not live by a book. So, and I know you don't live by the book, but I unfortunately, uh, the vast majority but, but of religious people in the world do. But I don't turn around and say, and do. therefore chuck it all out. The language exactly. that you use... Did I say chuck it all you out? You said... Why deal with the Bible at all? I said, why deal with the yes. Bible as a moral text? I, I value the Bible hugely as a work of literature, uh, as, I've quote, as I've said in yes. my book, The God Delusion, um, at some length. Um, so, yes. Why but, is that? What, what about that stuff, though, uh, you know, uh, Bishop Michael, the, the moral guidance in Leviticus? If you lie with another man, you're put to death. If you lie with your neighbor's wife, both of you are put to death. If you're a witch, you're put to death. Uh, if you curse your mother or your father, you're put to death. I mean, it's pretty strong and offensive to a lot of people in this day and age. Yes, the Bible uh, has, I mean, particularly the Old Testament, has a great deal in it which was about the society in the desert and how people were to survive in the desert. But uh, certainly from the Christian point of view, none of that applies to any of us today. What we are talking about is the moral and not the cultic teaching of the Bible, mm -hmm. which is to be found in the Decalogue. And where would we be as a society without the Ten Commandments? Well, let me, let me where take would up we the be without the ten... our Lord's summary of the law? Where Let's would take we up be... the Ten Commandments. Let me, finish. Let, me, let me finish. Where would we be without our Lord's summary about loving God and loving neighbor? These things are foundational mm. to our moral thinking. Richard, where would we be without the Ten Commandments is the Commandment question. number one, thou shalt have no other God before me. Commandment number two, thou shalt make no graven image. Commandment number that three, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. Commandment number four, thou shalt observe the Sabbath. What's that got to do with anything? It everything means well, humility. It means, I want to say, everything. that it means humility. The first commandment, there is a God. The second commandment, don't have other gods. What does it mean? I'm God. You're yeah. not. Yeah. Therefore, it's about suppressing our ego and knowing that I, as a human, am not the centre of everything. Precisely. <laughs> what about other... Just stepping back a little bit, the, the, the strand of debate that we had a, a, a couple of minutes ago about other sources for our moral framework. I nearly said moral compass. Uh, <laughs> the <laughs> Gordon Brown phrase. You know what I mean. But I'm... I'm um pretty staggered actually at some of the comments that have been made. Um, as a Western culture we are very text based, we're very text focused. Um, there are other cultures past and present that are not text based mm. or text focused, whether religious or not. Yes. They have no problems in negotiating their own sense of a, a moral frame. You don't need a book of any description to help you to have some kind of moral awareness. Most of the main religions the main monotheistic religions in, in the present day basically advocate treating other people with fairness and treating them decently. But Which one are you thinking of? Are you thinking of caste in Hinduism or are you thinking of the denial the essence, of the human person people, in Buddhism? Most or people are, what are you we thinking? are social creatures and essentially most religions would say ultimately at the end of the day it's about treating each one another fairly. But that, that, where does that go? That's what humanists would say. That's what most societies would no, say. I'm afraid I don't this know. is a hugely no. idealistic Religion. view of yeah. society. What's wrong with being idealistic? Well, it's because it's wrong. I mean, <laughs> have you ever come across the caste system? Have you ever lived I'm not as an untouchable there is in not India? Not injustice. We are human no, huge after injustice, all. Yeah. We're human. But there's been huge injustice the, in history in, in various Christ, Christian epochs. Of course, as well. there has been. But the Bible has been there to criticise it. And as we, as you've just said. 
ideas about the abolition of slavery, about uh, human rights, about civil rights have been derived. I mean, Martin Luther King was a minister of the gospel. I've been to his church. I've seen the pulpit from which he preached every week. So the, is the Bible the moral guide above all else for this planet? It is, um, it is historically the guide that has led to the kind of decent people that we are that Professor Dawkins has mentioned. But, but Bible, the Bible also says that thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. And uh, when that was taken as a moral principle, thousands of women died. Over, now, over centuries. Over in, centuries. In, in, in Europe, so yeah. as soon as you make the book the guidebook, rather than the one to whom the book bears witness, yes. You're going to get into all manner of trouble. Stephen. And that's exactly why we need constantly to be reinterpreting, re-examining, looking at the re understanding afresh the Bible in the context of 2011, not 2011 years ago, when, you know, we're talking about the, that society, that culture, well, the attitudes which permeate through... Why not, why not, new why not, why not a, a, you know, a fundamental uh, thought about revision? Then, because those. Are... I don't want to revise it. Well, we why just not have new to books? There have been it's holy things. It's a vital historical document. Right. We don't ask to revise the it's writings been revised of Plato. In the past, Stephen. Or the, 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 you know, we actually no, put new books in to... and take some of the others out. We, no, we you know. actually need to understand it and understand the fundamental thinking and philosophy behind it in fresh ways. In the light of history, yes. In the light of modern theological criticism, yes. And we need to. Use revelation, which I believe didn't stop 2,000 years exactly. ago, yeah, but yeah. continues in the context of the society in which we live today. That means the end of slavery, the bad treatment of women, and some of the other stuff that, frankly, is rubbish in the Bible. But how do you decide? <laughs> frankly, it's rubbish in the Bible. That's, there it's, is it's, some rubbish in the I'm Bible. I'm looking at that purple shirt of yours no, and no hearing problem. what you're saying. No <laughs> problem. <laughs> I, I, I am, I am oh, not. I am not a Christian who finds simply my faith based on a book written 2,000 plus years ago. It's actually part of Revelation and part of my faith in Jesus Christ. So, so we all want to do good and we can discuss together how to, how to do good. Why would we bother to go back to a book that was written 2,600 years ago um, in order to, to do that, when you think who wrote that book, they were ignorant, they were desert-dwelling scribes, oh. they had oh. absolutely oh. no... Oh. 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 This is, this is the arrogance of the modern world. Well, were, this is, wait a minute. This is arrogance, that these well, people, these geniuses who put the Bible together... Genius. Are uh, genius. Genius. Because you, <laughs> even, even at the level of literature, if you, I mean, why do you admire it as literature if they were not geniuses? Well, it, I admire the English literature of the... Oh, I've, I've no idea the about the original Hebrew. English. I know. Um, well, I, to, to look at the Bible and have no idea about the original Hebrew and then to say they yeah. were ignorant yeah. is frightening. Francesca. Yeah. 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 I've got to answer that. Well, okay, wait, 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 wait a minute. I've got, I've, I've got to answer that. Um, of course, the Bible was written in Hebrew. I was about to say when I was cut off that I have no way of judging the literary quality of the original so Hebrew. I'm told, I can read Hebrew and I'm told that it's very good. Let Richard finish, please. Let Richard finish, please. I'm told that the original uh, Hebrew is, is, is a very good quality. Nevertheless, um, when we're talking about moral philosophy, when we're talking about the origin of the cosmos, when we're talking about the origin of life, when we're talking about why, why we all exist, there is no reason whatever why we should treat the, the, the writings of scribes in whatever it was, 800 BC, 600 BC, as being particularly wise. We could listen to Confucius, we could listen to the Buddha, there are all sorts of people we could listen to, and we could listen to modern philosophers as well and modern scientists as well. Once again, I come back to the point, there is nothing special about the Bible. Yes, I want to say, because it depends... Francesca, do forgive me, Laura, because no, Francesca fine. is going to Defend stand the up for the yeah. Hebrew scribes. Go get I'm, them. I'm, I'm, yes, I Go think Francesca. I'm going to stand up for the Bible. I think um, we're all at risk of judging ancient people mm. just because they're not like us, just because they've got very different ideas and cultural values to us. Sacrifice? Yeah, most people don't really sacrifice within the Christian and Jewish traditions today. Some do, but most don't. That's something that's been moved away from. And it's not just because of a shift in the holy space. It's also about our new ideas about animals. Mm. But I really feel that these ancient peoples were incredibly sophisticated, cultured, 
And the biblical writers themselves, the, it's not just that the Hebrew is very good, this is beautifully crafted literature. Well, it's yes, fantastic. Sure. But I mean, that's why I mentioned Confucius as well. It, but it, I think not to, I mean, don't call them ignorant just because they had a different yeah. idea about the origins of the world than we do. I think well, that's I'm not sorry, judge these ancient sim people. simply means lacking knowledge. It's not, it's not a pejorative. It simply well, they means had a knowledge that was different from ours. It did, it, but it's wrong. <laughs> it's just plain wrong. Right. <laughs> OK, so my, as a reformed Jew, and I think on behalf of lots of progressive religious people, my idea is that the Bible has developed. And no, you don't stay with just the Bible. The Bible in my life has a vote. It, it doesn't have a veto on my life. And yes, the other worlds and the other philosophies are very important. I'm not stuck in the Bible, yeah. but I'm going to stick up for the Bible. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah go. Well, can, I, can I say, I, I, I was going to agree with the bishop over here, who didn't want to revise the Bible. I don't want to revise the Bible, I want to replace it with something, something else, like, for instance, A.C. Grayling's good book. Which is an empty, vacuous, no, which is, human... It, it, it's, I, it's excuse me, can I, can I just finish? Because I actually find it... I, I find thou it, I find shalt it, not butt in. Sorry. I, I, find <laughs> it, I find it poetic, inspirational, and scientifically correct, unlike the Bible. And it's, it's the sort of thing that is actually of value, not the only thing, but it's an example of what I think would be useful today, instead of the Bible. And you, sir, let, let, let's get, if I may, can I, I'll okay. just get some, don't worry, you're going to have a shot. No. Quick points, quick points. We need to find out, what, is the Bible relevant? Without the Bible, I will not be a human being at all. I studied a lot of humanism, a lot of sciences, nothing was able to transform my life. And there in the Bible I found meaning, that's why I am here, even before uh, here. Because you mentioned, um, ignorance and other things. That's what people like me were considered a long time ago. But the Bible liberated us. It's, made, it's given meaning to your life. Yes, sir. Yeah, Ian. Um, there are lessons we can learn today from the egalitarian lives of people who live, say, in the Congo forest, the back of pygmies, the people in Amazonia, who have a moral code, even if they've never heard of the Bible. That's right. yeah. And, yeah. and they, they, also, they, they also live more in harmony with their environment. Despite we, the absence of a moral code. How do we code, explain that code. then, uh, yeah. Bishop Michael? This, this, People with a moral code who've never heard of well, the Bible. Of course, I mean, every, every human being has a moral sense implanted in them by God. We are not in any way doubting that. But I would urge you not to idealize the communities in the Amazon. Uh, there has been internecine warfare among them. They Don't have say they're each other that out. Into a lot I mean, of the Alka Indians, there's been cannibalism. I mean, all of these things. You, you, you know, mm. no human society is perfect. It, uh, at it, Ian's, all. A, Ian's a distinguished primatologist, just to say, carry on. I just say, it's a fact of human behavior that we form alliances, we fight each other, then we ch change sides yeah. and, and form other alliances. That's Absolutely. what humans do. Well, that's do. why you have the fratricide in the Bible that that's comes right. on so Absolutely. early mm. and is there as the big warning. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what about this whole idea about revision? That would be just anathema to you, Chris, wouldn't it? It's there, yeah. and it's perfect, and it's the word of God, and you've got it in your hands. I think that's the difference. It, it, we're not saying, Christians don't believe this to just be another piece of literature. We believe that when we read it, uh, God speaks. Um, and therefore, to um, edit God and to say, God, you can't say this, or I don't like this about you, um, is to reconstruct God in our own image. God speaks through it, but they didn't. It's not like you know Muslims believe the Quran is directly no, that's right. dictated. It's clearly it's, not dictated because it's, it's too contradictory for that. It no, can't it's be. not contradictory. Well, it's it does. It says that. Well, it is contradictory. Isn't no, it? I don't think it is. No. Yes, it is. Well, I, I think, <laughs> Nikki, Nikki, I think you're right. It wasn't. It wasn't like dictated no, by no. by God, and it's not meant to be read like that. And and uh, why we can. Why we can but it is, there are hugely contradictory things in the Bible. Aren't of, course, of course there are hugely contradictory things, but that's why I said earlier okay. that okay. the Bible... Okay. Listen, I'm just a presenter. Can anyone give a contradictory Bible thing in the Bible? Is, to... The Bible is not a single book, it, as somebody it's, just it's said. It's a library. Rightly, it's a, it's library. a library of books. Richard, would you care, would you care well, to... Well, Chris, Chris, okay. says, Chris says, give, give me an example of something contradictory well, in the Bible. Well, would well, you care to... Love your enemies and don't kill them. Sorry? Wait, we've got... one is different to the other. We've got one, Christina. There are different gospel Christian. stories, and that's that. Can you give Christian an example? They, they, they I mean, wait a minute. Okay, so if you take the Bible as a whole, a collection of books, you have Jesus saying, "Love your enemies, bless those that treat you badly." Hmm. In in the um, Old Testament story, Laura, um, you I have, have, to say you have people you have people saying, you know, smite them who don't stand up, and and those who don't stand up for your God, you know, kill them all. 
Uh, no, but that's just clean the Bible. One of the ones in the Old Testament, guy. I don't know, but there is there is love, like neighbor or something similar, in one of the books in the Old Testament. But the central verse, basically, of the Bible, absolutely at the centre. Is love your neighbour? So it's well. contradictory in the Old Testament and then, love because in other places it, is. It's, it says it says things that we see in the Quran more, you know, about hating your enemies oh, and killing them and all that kind okay. of stuff. I don't think that's helpful. Yeah. Got Jesus killed. Sorry. This is the talk that got Jesus killed. Jesus said it has been said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say no. Yeah. You know, if someone slaps you on the right hand of the cheek, turn the other cheek. So he said that, the Old Testament was wrong. That was revolutionary speak yeah, yeah, in those days. And that was, was the kind of stuff that got him killed. So he, he did uh, say yes, these things. He wouldn't, certainly would not have called it the Old Testament. And he that was that sure. <laughs> This has been a particular <laughs> bugbear of Laura's. We must apologise for it. <laughs> Um, I, so prefer, I prefer the term Hebrew Bible. It's yeah. not a great term, but mm. as an academic, I much prefer that term. Mm. Um, Jesus probably didn't have an Old Testament or a Hebrew Bible or a Tanakh. He was referring to a collection. It was a very fluid time, lots of literature. Well, what, how do you... Yes, but he knew lots of other things, I'm sure, that aren't recorded in the Gospels. So why would he have said so many things? Why would he have stuck his head above the parapet? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I... All we know about what Jesus may or may not have said is what the Gospels may or may, you know, we, there are lots of other Gospels that have Jesus doing amazing things. Jesus striking a child and then killing him and then resurrecting him. But that's why they're not canonical. That is why they're not listen, canonical. Listen, we're, 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 we're coming towards the end. And really, uh, just a few seconds for, for, from all of you. The, the, will the power of the Bible continue for another 2,000 years, Bishop Michael? Well, I hope honest. not. The, the Christian church is growing rap very rapidly throughout the world. Mm. I've just come back from East Africa. The Bible is absolutely relevant to the daily lives of these people. Well, Africa is the one place where that's true, and I think not the one place. There are also in Asia, is, also in Latin America. Richard, <laughs> also well, in India. Well, I think um, uh, if the Bible has any chance of, of lasting, it had better stick with the. King James Version, because once it gets turned into <laughs> modern English, everybody can read it and see what nonsense it is, whereas if you, can, if you read it in the... <laughs> We've only got one minute. Laura. I would say the Bible plus interpretations. OK. The Bible as a source. Francesca. I think we cannot possibly understand Western culture and the history of Western culture without the Bible, and so for that reason... Your equivalent in 2,000 years will still be in business. I think so. I'll, yeah, I'll still be in a job, or people like me will still be in a job, yeah. <laughs> well, that's good news. That's true. <laughs> Thank you all very much indeed for taking part. Thank you all very much. Um, all the debates continue on our message board. Next week we're in Birmingham. We hope to see you there. Goodbye from everyone here in Bury. Have a good Sunday.